Sunday of Advent, Eucharistic Prayer A. Everything you need for this service is in the bulletin and the hymn book. The words in bold are for you to say. Our celebrant today is Reverend Sam Sheridan. We have two readers come up to the lighting of the candle.
God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And bless be God's kingdom, now and forever. to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. Give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins, that we may meet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of Scripture. <coughs> From the book of Isaiah. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her turn, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. A voice says, Cry out, and I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass, their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, and the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good things, good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please read responsibly by whole verse, the portion of Psalm 85. You have been gracious to your land, O Lord. You have restored the good fortune of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people, and now I have all their sins. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. Truly his salvation is very near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth, truth shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Life. Righteousness shall go before him, and peace shall be a pathway for his feet. Please stand for the gospel hymn number 699. <coughs>
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Set us on the right path that with uprightness of heart and holy joy we may eagerly await and work toward the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives with you in the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> July 29th, 1974, 11 women were ordained to the priesthood at the Church of the Advocate in Philadelphia. In September of 1975, four more were ordained priests in Washington, D.C. And finally, in 1976, the General Convention of the Episcopal Church resolved to ordain women to the priesthood and the episcopacy in general. It's been about 50 years. Fifty years is a long time for a person. It is not a long time for a church. Our women priests are new, and I have a theological problem with how we have dealt with the last 50 years. We have not apologized. We're supposed to be about truth-telling, about reconciliation, we also believe that God is timeless and unchanging, as in does not shift positions on things, like the ordination of women. So God did not, from our perspective, from the church's perspective, cannot have decided in the mid-70s that now is about time. We should get around to letting ladies join. That is logically incoherent, and theologically, like, a bad argument. God doesn't change God's mind. I believe in ordaining women. I am married to an ordained woman. I believe that Paul's letter to the Romans describes Phoebe as a deacon. I can outline the ways in which first and second century Christians treated women uniformly and unambiguously better than both their Jewish and Roman counterparts. I finally went to seminary and I sat down and I learned the arguments that people who do not believe in the ordination of women make, and I thought, well, that's kind of dumb. <laughs> like I looked at them like, well, but Jesus was a man. And I'm like, yeah, I don't, that's this is not a compelling, it's not a slam dunk, Dave. Like, I'd sit down in this room, I'd sit down in any room, and defend the ordination of women. I'm not old enough to remember a church that didn't do this. Uh, I believe in it, and therefore I am stuck with a syllogism. 
God calls women to be ordained deacons, priests, and bishops. And God is unchanging and timeless. Therefore, God has always called women to be deacons, priests, and bishops. We were getting it wrong. And we did repent. That's what the word means, to turn around. We started doing it a different way. We turned around and got it right. Yeah. But we skipped confession. We skipped admission of guilt and apology for what we did wrong and trying to make restitution, which is all part of what we believe on paper. We've never apologized. We've never apologized to generations of women for centuries <clears throat> of not hearing their call to ministry. And I'm sorry that I'm about to use this phrase. I couldn't think of one that more correctly uh, summed up my feelings. It pisses me off. Because <laughs> this church taught me that when you get something wrong, you confess it, and you admit it, and you apologize, and I don't understand why we haven't done that. And I bring it up with important church people every chance I get. Because there's nothing like being an important church person to invite somebody telling you what they think. <laughs> when I was a seminarian, I was on a pilgrimage in the Holy Land, and I was having dinner with a, a bishop, a priest, and a deacon. This is not the setup for a joke, that's just what happened. <laughs> in Nazareth, I had dinner with this bishop from the Church of England, a canon to the ordinary, which is a very high-ranking priest in her diocesan office, and a French Anglican deacon. I didn't know there were French Anglicans. I now know there's at least one because I've met her. Um, I asked them a tough question. I'm like, for there to be true repentance and reconciliation, should not the church apologize to women for hundreds of years of not ordaining them? Well, the bishop said the thing you'd expect a bishop to say. He appealed to ecclesial authority and the canons of the church. When the canons of the church did not allow women to be ordained, uh, not ordaining women was adhering to church law, so there was nothing to apologize for. Now the canons have been corrected, so there is still nothing to apologize for. Okay, Bishop. <laughs> now this priest, was not one of those first 15 that I mentioned, but she was one of the earliest ordained women in the church. And she said she was not interested in my lofty ideals kind of apology. She called me a millennial, which was hurtful. I, I am a millennial, but it was hurtful anyway. <laughs> she had been in the early years of her ministry, I mean, she'd been ordained a priest and she would regularly receive death threats. Her bishop held the clergy conferences for the diocese in the men's locker room at the YMCA so that she, he wasn't technically not allowing her to attend. She's like, I don't care about an apology. I gotta heal before I care about y'all's apology. And some of the people who have hurt me in that way are dead. So it's God's problem now. <laughs> My deacon friend. She grew up like me. She's only known men and women in ministry positions. And she just rejected my premise outright. She said, I wouldn't accept an apology because I would take that to mean that my being a woman was a factor in my ordination. You and I, she and I are both priests now. And she's like, I reject outright the implication that we are different. Keep my gender out of your mouth. I don't know. I don't know who's right, even though I made fun of the bishop and made a little sound. So <laughs> I clearly have some opinions. I doubt any of us changed our mind. We agreed that uh, women had positions we would consider to be ordained in the earliest churches. And then we bickered about everything else. And bickering and arguing about what's going on at church 
is just a well-established part of Christian witness. Uh, Y'all just did the annual meeting, you know. <laughs> Bickering is important. Uh, politely is also important. Sometimes Christians have started wars. We don't want that. We may wonder why God doesn't just come down here and sort it all out. Why can't we fix this? Why won't you fix this? We cannot know God's whole mind, but it is reasonable to wonder, to ask, why God doesn't just tell us, you know, the way to do it. Why God doesn't just fix the broken world right now, or at least unify a broken, bickering church. Asking that question isn't faithless. That's a perfectly faithful response, considering the world we live in compared to the gospel we believe in. Why don't we have all the answers yet? God, what's taking you so long? Part of the answer is God's timelessness, God's eternity, baked into every page and sentence of Scripture. John the Baptist was using what were for him ancient words from Isaiah when he came out of the wilderness calling for repentance. John hearkened for God's people to return to an ancient faith. Some of the things that he said people have been saying for a thousand years when he got around to them. God's people have been asked again and again to turn back around. To remember what God has already done and what God promises to do. Our Advent is waiting in the same holy space of John's ministry. And John's ministry is literally Isaiah's prophecy. Circumstances change. God never changes. Isaiah prophesies to a conquered and exiled Israel and Judah living in Babylon. John the Baptist calls to a Jewish people living under foreign occupation. These voices and more cry out to people who are already saved, already rescued, already delivered, and still genuinely waiting for God to do more. God's people remember how God has brought us this far. And also, like, well, we, we'd be ready to go further. We could do more. They witness to people living in this broken, fractured world. And they call on those same people. They call on us to remember that God is faithful, that God is timeless, that God is very near and out in the wilderness at the same time. And that is the whole tension of Advent, waiting for something that's already happened. It isn't a sign that we don't understand what God's doing. Uh, we don't understand what God's doing. That's a part of it also. But it's not a flaw in the logic of Advent that we're waiting on something that happened 2,000 years ago. That tension <coughs> is part of our witness, part of our inheritance. Look, the Bible says, look at what God has already done for us, and yes, we're still waiting, and don't just wait, go out and do something. To bring about God's kingdom on your own, because you have some power. And sometimes it's not even go do something specific. Nobody has to agree with me about stuff. This reading from Isaiah, a voice cries out, or a voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? Get up on a high mountain. Lift up your voice with strength. Herald the good tidings. Lift up, do not fear. Say to the cities, here is your God. 
And that's not very complicated. You don't need a fancy graduate seminary degree to say, no, this is what I believe. This is why I live this way. This is who I am. <coughs> I am loved. You are loved. God has come. God is coming back. I don't know which of us was right. The seminarian waiting on some grand reconciliation over women's ordination. The bishop saying church law does not require it. The priest who yearned for a different, more personal kind of healing. The deacon who was insulted by the implication in the first place. But I have met several young women who in the context of confirmation classes were surprised to learn from me that there even are churches that don't ordain women. I don't know if we've missed the boat on that apology or not, but this is a space where we built a world that's a little bit better. Where there are little girls who might look up at my wife and not even realize that was new. Not even realize that that was a question for anyone. We're building a world where the dignity of every human being is just a little bit greater all the time. Hopefully, practically, also hopefully inside of us. And the world needs that. Because we see a lot of people aren't interested in the dignity of every human being at all. So whether we're going to bicker about it or not, whether my version of that's going to look like your version of it or not, being people who care about the world getting better is important. And whatever complications or frustrations or tensions or problems or battles against injustice lie ahead of us, even our bickering over it is preparing the way, making the paths straight. The world is still pretty broken, but God is timeless. God is faithful. And in this church, sometimes I see we who seek to follow Jesus are faithful too. And that's what we're waiting on and what we need and what we hope for in Advent. We both wait for God's incarnation and salvation at once already come and not yet. There are corners of the world and the church moving closer to God's dream, to God's kingdom, and in the most cosmic sense we are still waiting, but each day we get a little bit closer to the Christmas that is the beating heart of this universe. God in Christ in this world forever. Amen. Amen. service continues with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternal begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. True God. Begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, for the proceeds of the power and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge our baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Standing or kneeling as you're able, join me in the prayers of the people. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our bishops, Michael and Susan, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray the church. I ask your prayers for peace for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray, Pray for justice, justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray, Pray, Pray for, for those who may need me or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or deeper knowledge of Him. Pray, Pray that they may find and be found. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray, Pray for, for those who have died. I ask your prayers for Cindy, Mary Lynn, Horston, Paula, Vicki, Nicole and Laura, Sharon, Tom, John and Sabina, Jamie, Kathy, Christina, Pat, Father Jim, Father Ty, Devin, Katie, Barbara, Karen, Buzz, Chris, Roger, Sean, Poppy, Tatum, Sam, Mary Margaret and Matt, Deborah, Mary, and John. For shove-ins, Karen and Paul. For those celebrating birthdays, her. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Hear our humble prayers, Lord God. That we may serve you in holiness and faith and give voice to your presence among us until the day of the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. And sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power of the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. <coughs> Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. I may take a moment to explain before we get to our final prayer. Um, I am going to run off during announcements. I love talking to y'all after the service and in the receiving line, um, but during the announcements I'm going to sneak off because uh, it's getting a real tight before I need to be at St. Paul's for lessons and carols. I could have had more time between the two if the preacher hadn't gone on for 20 minutes, but <laughs> we can't stop that. <laughs> Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. 
Now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, the all and glory, now and forever. Amen. May the sun of righteousness shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you for always. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Please stand for our closing hymn, number 383, Embarrassed Lord Jesus. Jesus, and that we long for him to come once again into this world. As people who know and await blessing, let us go forth into the world in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be God. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Join us for coffee hour. We'll have a